Hey, ZPAC, welcome to the ZDog MD show. It's Dr. Demania, ZDog MD, if you're nasty. All right, today, one of my favorite people, he's been a two time guest on this show, Dr. Ron Sinha. He is a internal medicine doctor at Palo Alto Mel Medical Foundation, my old haunting grounds, stomping grounds, haunting grounds, because now I'm a ghost. Uh, here in Palo Alto in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, he has made a worldwide reputation uh, for being able to help treat patients with things like metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, particularly in certain cultural groups like South Asians. But he's even more known now for working in corporate areas, teaching people who particularly work from home, may have sedentary lives, how to be more healthy and avoid things like diabetes, heart disease, polycystic ovary syndrome. And I will definitely link to his other interviews he's done with us before they were really, really, really educational. But today, we're going to talk about something that is, I don't know, on everyone's mind, which is COVID-19 and how, first of all, we can understand what may put us at risk as patients for actually getting very sick from COVID and how that relates to everything Ron's been talking about. And then more importantly, what we can actually do to actually get in shape so that we're less at risk were we to actually come down with the infection. Ron, welcome back to the show, man. Hey, great to be here, man. It's, it's fun. Third time's a charm, huh? <laughs> hey, did I, so did I get any of that intro wrong? Cause I just make that stuff up as I go. You nailed it, man. You're amazing. <laughs> no formal training. Hey, so, so how have you been doing? You look great by the way. So COVID has been good to you clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Like my pigmentation, I'm getting a tan off it. Everything's feeling good right now. But, you know, I think we talked about this before the show. I think we're busy as heck right now, which is a good thing because we want to get a message out to our people. Obviously, the pandemic's not a good thing, but I think it's making a lot of us rethink our health personally on a population level and what things we need to do. So all of a sudden, a lot of my patients or clients that keep postponing health till later, like I won't get a heart attack till 10 years later. Now all of a sudden it's on their mind because something can happen within days, weeks or months. So, so that's not the kind of alarm flag I wanted to happen for my patients, but we should really take advantage of this opportunity to see what we need to prioritize around yeah. the pandemic. That's so important because like, it's true. These sort of chronic diseases, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, hypertension, this sort of stuff, it's, it's silent. Like nobody thinks about it, right? But now everyone's like, hey, guess what? That stuff is a risk factor. All the epidemiology we're seeing, if you have that, you are more likely to do very poorly with COVID-19. And we, I think we're going to get into a little bit about why that might be, be based, based on pathophysiology, but it's never been more important. You know, I gotta, I, I'm not going to lie to you. So over the last... Uh, few weeks being at home, I have sort of, and, and you know, there's the stress of like all this stuff, right? So I've been comfort eating a little bit. I've been eating ice cream, which I never do. I go to Lunardi's, which is our local grocery store. And they have this ice cream, Lunardi's brand ice cream, which is really treat ice cream from San Jose. It's a little shop. It's so damn good, dude. But it is, it's like a dopamine surge every time I have a bite. So my midsection has gotten a little chubbier, even as I've grown more muscle mass because I'm like, I'm, it's like being in prison, like I'm lifting weights, but I'm pretty clearly metabolically less healthy than I was. And so now if I get infected along with my clotting disorders, factor five Leiden and prothrombin 2021A, I'm gonna die like a dog. So let's start to just dig in. Now that I put my own medical history out there and violated my own HIPAA, let's dig into this because I think there are a lot of people who are watching who are going to be like, dude, that's me in, to some degree, and, and what can I do to stay safe? Absolutely. So I, I think my purpose to really for this interview is number one, we got to empower people with knowledge and not breed paranoia because some of the things I might talk about might make us think that, oh my God, I'm going to die, you know, because of this. But hopefully we can provide some tools during this interview that are going to give you some strategies that I've used personally in myself and also with my patients too. But I think at a high level, what you brought up is so key. I, I think we need to start looking at COVID-19 less as an infectious disease, which it clearly and obviously is and really looking at it as more of a lifestyle disease like anything else. If we already put that lens over it, we can start doing the right things. And a lot of the research I'm doing, Z, has been focused on, lifestyle is such a general broad term, right? There's a million different things we can do, but I've been digging deep into the science of what can we specifically do that will have the most impact on protecting us from COVID-19. And guess what? The icing on the cake is anything you do to protect yourself against COVID-19, once we're over this pandemic nightmare, it's gonna help you live longer, it's gonna lower your risk of heart disease, diabetes, cancer, all the crap that we've been talking about in the past. So. 
So I, I thought one thing is I'm kind of a visual learner and a visual teacher. And for those of you that might be watching this on YouTube, some might be listening to a podcast, at some point I'd have you check out the YouTube because I'm gonna put up a couple of slides that have been game changing in my talks to big Silicon Valley companies. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna kind of be a little bit of a teacher and put some slides up if that's cool with you. I love that idea. And I actually wanna also mention that since you're talking to these big Silicon Valley companies, why is that relevant? It's re relevant because they have a high proportion of people with early metabolic syndrome, people who are not exercising in a way that actually it helps their insulin resistance that eat like crap that are sedentary and that are now at home. And so this is a perfect Petri dish for disaster and you're there to try to help. Very well summarized, absolutely. So, you know, I know your audience is pretty savvy about this stuff, but the first thing I'd like to do is I wanna sort of step back and show you guys what's happening with COVID-19. Because one of the greatest threats to our immune system is fear of the unknown. You know, it's funny because when I give stress talks, Z, sometimes I have to come up with analogies. Like when you look at your email in basket, pretend it's a tiger chasing after you. But right now, that analogy, actually, I would rather be chased by a tiger because I can see what's coming after me and I either get eaten or I can hide. But now all of a sudden, my analogies are actually mute at this point because we're in the face of an unknown predator, which we can't see. And that can be an amazing trigger to our immune system. So one key thing I tell people is we have to empower ourselves with knowledge, which you're doing an incredible job of. Because if we can turn on that logical brain while we think about the situation, we're gonna tame the impact on our immune system. So that's my effort here with this diagram. So here, we basically got COVID-19. And what's happening, and hold on one second, let me just make sure the technical. So when COVID-19 basically enters our lung cells, it enters using the ACE2 receptor. It's got an instruction manual, which is the RNA gene. So it's got a copy of the instruction manual, but it doesn't have the 3D printer to make copies of itself, right? So it goes inside our cells, and in this example, I'm talking about the lung cell, and it hijacks our 3D printer. So once it's inside, it basically starts making copies of itself. And so that's the viral replication process that happens inside our cells. So that whole process, I kind of refer to as being the viral load, the external factor. Now, as a result of that viral replication, what happens internally in our body is we start to launch an immune system attack. And there's a specific molecule that I want you to keep in mind, because I think the more we can put some terms around this, the less you know, sort of unknown and fearful we're gonna be. So there's one sensor inside our cell and it's called NLRP3, okay? And NLRP3 is like an alarm sensor inside our cells. And it specifically reacts when COVID-19 hits the surface of our receptor, that ACE2 receptor. And what NLRP3 does is when that alarm signal is set off, it recruits messengers called cytokines, these tiny protein molecules that come and they try to defend us. But the problem, and I think Z, you've talked eloquently about this with prior guests, is if we have an overload of that cytokine coming in, we call it a cytokine storm, I actually refer to it as a cytokine fire, because when that fire gets out of hand, as I'm showing in this diagram, we actually initiate a process called pyroptosis. Now, pyroptosis is an interesting term. You might have heard of a term called apoptosis, I'm sorry, apoptosis, which is cellular program death. But pyroptosis is actually a specific term that when you have an infection like a virus attached to your cell, it triggers inflammatory cell death. So literally you are starting a fire which will cause a cell to explode and die. And then all the fluid and inflammatory factors are what leads to a lot of the complications that we see. So when you look at this, again, you're thinking about viral load external and then you're thinking about cytokine load internal. And that's why I summarize this in my sort of diagram here. For the last several months, see, we've been focused on viral load, the external factors, social distancing, hand hygiene, masks, you know, fomites, whatever. And that's important to do. But what I'm telling people is if we over obsess and exclusively focus on the external, we're gonna create a lot of internal stress. We gotta shift to the right side of the diagram and think about some of the factors we'll talk about today, the internal cytokine load, the stress, the sleep, the nutrition, the activity, the underlying conditions, the visceral fat, which we'll dig down in a moment. But that's kind of my high level aerial view of sort of what's happening in this system. So that, that's really helpful from a visual standpoint. And what's interesting here is you start to immediately jump to what seems to now become obvious looking at this, which is, yeah, okay, you've got these two components, viral load, which is gonna be important, but the cytokine load is what's gonna put you at risk for that catastrophic sequence of events that ultimately leads to the inflammatory cascade that leads to the 
complications that you see, whether it's all the goo, <laughs> for lack of a better medical term, in the right. lungs that prevents oxygenation, or whether it's the blood pressure and multi-organ system failure, or the myocardial damage, the heart damage, the kidney damage, those kind of things that result from the cytokine load. Now, w one thing I wanted to ask you, because there are some theories, right, that cytokine storm part of the reason that young kids don't necessarily get so sick from this is that they have enough of immune system that they can kind of suppress viral load a little bit, but they don't have an, a robust enough immune system to launch a cytokine storm. Is that something you've heard as well? Yeah, and that's a common question I get. And right now, as you know, there's nothing definitive around this, but I think that intuitively makes a lot of sense based on this. That they've got that cytokine dial is right. It's like a thermostat. You want it at the right level, um, but exactly right. And later on, when our cytokine storm is getting more activated, and some of this is genetic and developmental, but a lot of it I think is emotional too. Because I know back when I was, you know, a certain age. I was an internalizing stress about work, about marriage, about my mortgage and all these things. So I think we have more cytokine inflaming factors there, but also you're right, our immune system is um, a little bit different than younger kids. So I, I think that theory makes a lot of sense. Awesome, and everything on that cytokine load column is stuff that can actually affect your cytokine. So stress, sleep, nutrition, activity, those affect cytokine load. Big, big time. Yeah, I'm going to show you some of the mechanisms. But I think to me, that's a hopeful message. Like up till now, you might be sort of scared of what we're talking about. But all of the things on the right side are things that we can influence, impact. And believe me, this cytokine connection has been there for decades. There's multiple studies that show the impact of sleep and stress, activity, body composition on cytokines. And, you know, again, when you take that fire analogy, Z, yeah. I tell people that our cells, you know, the environment that COVID encounters, if we're thinking about fire, we don't want there to be flickering flames and dry kindling inside our cell before COVID-19 even attaches. Because if we have a very flammable environment, that's going to make us much more susceptible to having that cytokine firestorm. So, you know, many of us for many years have been initiating negative sort of lifestyle habits that are on the right side of this graph. And then all of a sudden, if you introduce a virus like COVID-19 into it, we can cause a lot of baseline excess inflammation. So I want to dampen those flames because really honestly, as you know, as we re-enter back into society, you know, I tell people, you know, I'm going to be out in the front lines at some point. I'm doing most of my televideo visits. But I've accepted the fact that there's a really strong chance that I've been exposed or I will be exposed to COVID-19 at some point over the next several months. So now the game is going to be, how do I keep my cytokine and that flame under control? You know, so I think that's the way we sort of want to think about this. I, I like that analogy because it reminds me of the California wildfire analogy. If you have a bunch of dense vegetative overgrowth and then you get a spark, you're going to burn really fast. And this is why because people, part of the reason people are stressed, Ron, I think is that they feel no sense of control and they feel like, okay, this is this horrible enemy that I can't fight. But the truth is there are things that we can do that will help give us a sense of control, lower our stress levels, which will help. It's a virtuous cycle, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. So should we launch into some of these strategies? What do yeah. you think? Show me. Do you, are you going to show slides or you want me to look at you? You know what? I'm going to show you a couple more, and then we'll go one-on-one on, one on Perfect. this. Perfect. Right? Let me flip so, that back. So there we go. A few quick things. I wanted to highlight for you this covesity mechanism. So I call this term covesity, and basically it's a connection between that visceral fat and how that puts us at risk. So again, now that you're familiar with this diagram, I wanted you guys to sort of check out this diagram of this guy here with the visceral fat. And what I want to make clear is inside his belly, he's got these chemicals that I highlighted, which are cytokines like IL-6 and TNF-alpha. These are pro-inflammatory cytokines. So when we're carrying extra belly fat, we're already fueling that flame that we talked about. You eloquently call it the dry kindling of the firestorm. Really, that's what we're doing. The other um, chemical here also is angiotensin-2. And angiotensin II, as you probably know, that is a specific molecule. It's not a cytokine, but it has been intimately linked to COVID-19 risk. In fact, they're finding that individuals with elevated serum levels of angiotensin II have more acute lung injury. It's also associated with myocardial remodeling. It's a powerful, powerful vasoconstrictant. So all these factors, these chemicals can come out of our belly fat and contribute to that firestorm. So I just wanted to make that point really clear in this, how important this connection between visceral fat and that cytokine load really is. And it's so interesting because angiotensin II is what binds to ACE2 receptors, correct? 
That's exactly right. Yeah. So this is part of the same cascade. They're all intimately related. And what's interesting is visceral adipose tissue. So just a little bit of belly fat can increase the levels of these things that are then affiliated by, by association with this process. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You got it. I'm going to show one last slide and we can get back to face to face here. Um, but this one was really interesting to me because I got to say that the, the studies that are out there Z, on emotional stress and emotional suppression and cytokine surges, it's pretty compelling. And this is one study that really resonated with me because if emotional suppression was an Olympic sport, I would be a gold medalist. <laughs> I've grown up emotional suppressor a lot of my life, like a lot of guys and people from our cultural background. Right. But I wanted to show you this study, which I thought was just mind blowing. And I've shown this on a lot of my Silicon Valley talks. And what they literally did was they took a group of subjects and they emotionally rated them on a scale is either being cognitive reappraisers. And what cognitive reappraisal means is you'd literally say that I control my emotions by changing the way I think about the situation I'm in. So that's the reframing. Or you rate them as being expressive suppressors or emotional suppressors where they say I keep my emotions to myself, which is pretty much the DNA that I've sort of been brought up in. And then what they did is after they rated their emotional patterns, they actually sprayed some cold virus on them. It wasn't coronavirus, but rhinovirus. And then they measured their nasal cytokine levels to see how much cytokine was released locally. And often nasal cytokine level can be a surrogate marker for what's happening deeper down inside our cells. And what they found remarkably was cognitive reappraisers consistently had lower nasal cytokine levels, especially IL-6. So that to me was mind blowing. It just shows that our emotional, those subtle thought patterns can have a huge impact on immunity. You know, none of that surprises me in the slightest, Ron, because it it, 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 it just people, and, and it, it's true with like, if you get cancer, your likelihood of surviving actually seems that the people who reframe for the positive uh, and seem to see things through a positive lens tend to do better. Uh, it, you know, people live longer when they switch to hospice from, say, acute chemotherapy sometimes because there's suddenly this opening and this release of the contraction and stress state and the cortisol and all the all that stuff and. I, I wonder whether it's just cytokines or whether it's a broader thing, but even just anecdotally, I've noticed when I meditate regularly, I get less, I get less sick. I get less viruses. Now this is all anecdote, but just from a personal experience, it, it, there's something there to reframing and to stress reduction that I think is real. Yeah, I totally agree. I think both of us know anecdotally from dealing with patients that's there, but as you know, a lot of us that are kind of left brainers, we need sort of that scientific linkage. So I think this is an opportunity for us to really educate people. There is a molecule out there that's being directly impacted. And now in today's world, that molecule is linked to this pandemic virus and it might actually control our health outcomes from that. So I hope as a result of this, that it's gonna highlight everything you said, because you're right, it's remarkable how we approach things with our mind, how that can have an impact on immune system and disease onset and survival. So it's really critical. It makes me wonder too, and this is speculation, we see such a high prevalence within healthcare professionals of serious disease. So they get it, but then they actually get quite sick. And there was speculation that, you know, they're getting a high inoculum or, but I wonder too, whether those healthcare professionals that live with a constant burning fire of stress and immune suppression and that sort of thing. And now it's magnified by the lack of PPE, by the feeling that you're gonna bring it home to your family. There's the recent story about Lorna Breen who took her own life, uh, uh, emergency physician in New York. This is a, an epidemic of this and it affects healthcare professionals even more. But um, cur curious if a lot of your patients are actually healthcare professionals that you see. I have a fair number of those and you nailed it because number one, again, coming back to my framework, they're exposed to a huge viral external load. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, because of training and what they're exposed to, I mean, the worst thing is for an emotional suppressor to go through medical training where you're told not to share your vulnerability, like you're on surgical rounds, whatever, and you keep all your emotion and pain inside, right? And many of us, for us to actually, it's an adaptive function when we're on the wards and things, we learn to do that as a protective mechanism. But if we don't have adequate releases after those long shifts or during our breaks, and many of my patients are healthcare workers, they spend all their time thinking and breathing this at work. 
And then they're on their phone when they come home and the news, you know, you pick up your phone and every news headline story is related to this. Their brain is getting no break from this at all. So I've actually had to implement, I call this media distancing. I've had to implement significant media distancing where I have like a fixed amount of time, maybe a half hour or 60 minutes. I only check two or three news sources. I check those out and then I'm done with it because I don't want to hear anything related to COVID at that point. I'll just focus on my other stuff. And I think a lot of us healthcare workers need that even more than anyone because we're living and breathing it. My email work in basket, the number of COVID-19 updates I have through the internet are already overwhelming. So I don't need to do more on top of that. <laughs> the epic <laughs> inbox, man. Well, I think it's important. We I spoke with Judd Brewer, who's a psychiatrist on the show, and we talked about the social contagion. So someone may not sneeze on you, but through media and social media, you can be your brain can be sneezed on from anywhere in the world and that triggers its own set of responses so this is actually i like that idea of media distancing i wish i was better at it because now i feel like well it's part of my job to to scour the media and then parse it for my audience but man it is it's taking a toll on me dude i'll tell you like because there are people I, this is again this is an aside uh there are uh people who sometimes comment z like it seems like sometimes you're changing your emphasis on what you're talking about from show to show to show to show. Why is that? And then I look at it and I go, well, because I'm surrounded by data inputs that are contradictory <laughs> constantly. And you're trying to figure it out. And imagine what somebody who has no medical education's feeling like, right? It's a tremendous stress. It's key, but you know, I think you bring up a key point. So even if you can't detach yourself from the media, I think in your case, you're flooded because of the work you do. But even the subtle shift of how do you emotionally distance yourself while you're reading that news? So if you're doing research on it, if you take more of that cognitive logical approach that, you know what, I'm putting together a program that's going to help educate and empower and energize healthcare workers that are burning out on this. If you have a sense of mission and purpose around that, I think it's different. My wife, who's a pediatrician, she spends a lot of time looking at news stories. And in the beginning, I was like, Shell, you've got to calm this down. But I realized that for her, there's an element of intellectual stimulation. She loves public health. This is an interesting problem to be solved. She obviously is emotionally affected by it. But she's looking at it a little bit more at that Einstein logical brain. But you mentioned, you, you said it right, for people that are not educated along that, they think this is just utter chaos. The, the, the sky's falling, basically. So it's our job to provide a little bit of perspective and logic around that so we can take the edges off the emotion. But again, I think even if you're inundated with this media, having the right framework of looking at this um, is really key. Uh, you know, one thing that I think stressed out a lot of my patients is those heat maps, right? When you see those red circles expanding, people literally think that there's virus everywhere. You know, they don't realize that this is a density of the virus in certain areas, but people think that if I step outside my house, and I've done a, about a dozen televideo visits, and I have individuals, patients who are not even stepping outside into their backyard because they think the virus is floating everywhere. So those are the types of stigma we have to avoid. Have you noticed, because this is something that I pay careful attention to after reading a lot of Jonathan Haidt's work about uh, cognitive distortions. So, you know, in cognitive behavioral therapy, you're taught to recognize disorders, sorry, distortions of thinking. So depression to some degree is a disease of distorted thinking. We ruminate on these different ideas that are not accurate when you shine a light on them. There may be a kernel of truth, but the, but the ultimate truth is no, that's actually not what's true. And that rumination makes it very hard. Now, when we look at COVID and people's mental response to it, you see a lot of these distortions and you see it on Twitter a lot. I saw it this morning, catastrophizing. Oh my God we are never going to get out of this. We're all going to die or our economy is completely destroyed. We're never going to recover from this. That's catastrophizing or overgeneralizing. Oh, well, look, because, you know, it, this is happening in New York. Well, this is going to happen in my town or, you know, a uh, 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 failure to see the positive is another thing. Like, well, look at actually what's gone right. Like, we've actually bent the curve quite a bit. We've avoided having our healthcare system get overwhelmed in many levels, you know, so so I think it's important to recognize those distorted thinking patterns because if you can apply an antidote, it can actually lower stress. You know, you bring such a key point. I love this because just what you did, the process you went through of labeling your cognitive patterns, mm. that alone takes the edge off it. So if you know there's patterns of magnification, extreme language use, you know, sometimes I'm doing that too. My wife and I are talking, we're talking about our president and all this stuff. And then I, sometimes I tell myself, okay, there I go with extreme thinking or there I go with magnification. So there's a really interesting study that was done where at UCLA, they did functional MRI scans with people with these emotional thought patterns. And they found that 
the simple process of labeling your thoughts with one or two words tame down the emotional brain and engage the logical. So if you're getting into the pattern, so sometimes I'm like, oh, there I go thinking about being on a ventilator again. You know, even if I wrote down fear of ventilator, you know, on a piece of paper and I wrote that down and just tore that up, just that process can really take the edge of that. And you mentioned rumination. That's when we're stuck in our head in those movies over and over, but just a thought process. And for me, the great thing has been, you know, I, I go out with a hike with a friend of mine, socially distanced apart, and often we're kind of throwing those thought patterns off each other, you know? And so I think having those external outlets, and this is where our colleagues in the healthcare environment, wherever, if we can get some of that objectivity, that can really help us deal with these patterns. I love that. I love that. Naming, naming it is actually a way to heal it in this sense. And it, it, I like to think of it too, from a kind of a meditative perspective, it's like you have a thought arise or a impulse and that's beyond your free will. You don't choose what you think you choose your response to the thought. So now you have a space where you go, okay, I can either get lost in this and identify with it, or I can say, Oh, look at that. Ooh, that is, you know, I can label that. That's what's noting, right? Oh, that's what that is. And it really, do, it really does uh, change it. The, the book Feeling Good, which was the cognitive behavioral sort of breakthrough book by that Stanford guy back in 1980, they did a study where people who just read the book actually had improvements in their depression scores, <laughs> just purely from reading the book. And I think it was just purely from that same thing, naming the distort. Oh, my thinking is very distorted. And so maybe that's why I'm so unhappy all the time. So, totally. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I was going to ask you a question, Z. Um, do you, th there's one thing I've always meant to do, but I'm not very regular at, and that's actually keeping a journal. Do you do any journaling? I mean, I know you spend so much time, but I'm just curious if you do any of that. It, it's, I've done it historically. I haven't done it recently. It's so helpful. You know, and people, and again, th and this is again a slight tangent, but people who have, um, you know, psychedelics have been studied much more now for mental illness and things like that. The people who do the integration process afterwards, the journaling of the meaning they're getting out of their experience, have long lasting benefits as opposed to someone who does like LSD recreationally or mushrooms recreationally and they're going to have a good time. They don't get that lasting benefit. I think there's something to the, the writing things down and integrating it that's very important. Agreed. Yeah. And I, I've been telling people, I, I have not been disciplined about that. I feel like I'm doing so many other things in a disciplined way. That has not been on my bandwidth. But during this time, every few days, I'm, I'm actually journaling. I'm calling it my pandemic journal because imagine if we were going through this right now and we had a, a grandparent from the 1918 epidemic that actually shared some accounts of what they lived through. Wow. And, you know, through that frenzy, I'm sort of thinking like, what is a legacy I want to leave for my future project? You know, you know, whatever, 50, 60 years. Do I want them to know that I'm baking muffins every day? I'm gaining 20 pounds that I'm depressed, hiding under a blanket. Or is it that I want to share some vulnerability? You know, definitely this is a tough time for us, but we as a family have come together and this is what we're doing to get through it. And I think it kind of maybe energizes us to know that what we're doing now, we can really send a message to our future generations that when they go through their, God forbid, pandemic or whatever war or whatever comes up, you know, our ancestors were able to sort of rally and get through this. So it might be a way to sort of think about this. Process. Ah, I love that. You know what it is? It's like a Heisenberg uncertainty principle for, for, for life. You go, okay, if I measure it, if I write it down, it might actually change what I actually make happen. And that's very true because you can experience, like you said, the weight gain and all that. And, and or you can be like, well, now I'm writing this down. My kids are going to see this. I ought to be living my life a little bit differently now. So speaking of that, let's so, cause this is a great discussion, but I want to bring it back to what your your thesis here, which is this inflammatory response that can be so harmful. I think a lot of people wonder what is it that separates people who might get very sick in COVID from people who aren't and what can I actually do about it? So getting back to your fire analogy and all that, how, how do we think about that in terms of like people who are at risk in terms of diabetes or insulin resistance or hyper, like what's up with hypertension? Why is that a risk factor? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. With hypertension, we're not quite sure, but okay, so a couple of things. Number one, it does sometimes reflect the fact that angiotensin II is very active, and we talked about the fact that angiotensin is linked to myocardial and lung injury. Um, the second thing, too, is we are finding now, and this is even before COVID-19, we're now finding that hypertension is a predominantly inflammatory condition. And if you look at the specific pathways, guess which pathway is specific for hypertension inflammation? It's that same NLRP3. Oh. So there's an overlap between that as well, too. So I think all of this is sort of aligned. But, but yeah, let's get kind of tactical about this because 
I'm finding that a lot of my patients, like you said, their lifestyles now in shelter in are making things worse. But on the other hand, I have patients that are actually doing better because now they're not spending two hours on the road. They're not in a lot of unnecessary meetings. So first thing I'm telling people is all that time you spend doing unnecessary commuting and other time, let's devote some of that into activity. So your morning commute now is going outside for a 20 to 30 minute walk. And for anybody that has issues with weight or insulin resistance, Morning physical activity is absolutely essential. Before in the old days, I used to tell people, fit exercise in wherever you can. But if you want to lower sugar, body fat, and lower inflammation, if you have 60 minutes in the day to devote to exercise, you want to distribute that activity evenly throughout the day. And I'm going to tell you why. Because multiple studies show that when you do sit for more than 45 minutes to an hour at a time, elevated cytokine release actually happens. So you want to be a very fidgety worker. I mean, before we talked about this, you mentioned that you have a lot of gym equipment in your office. Hey, I'm, I'm down here right now. And today I've got like a kettlebell down here. I've got, um, let me see, I've got my exercise ball. Every day I've got different sorts of contractions. And the beauty is sometimes I'm, extra, I'm, I'm in a meeting and nobody knows, you know, I'm not always visible on, on the meeting. So I can be doing some of these exercises or stretching my hamstrings. But the whole thing is if you can distribute patterns of physical activity throughout the day, it's going to be metabolically healthier for you. It's going to lower insulin resistance and it's going to keep that cytokine storm much lower too. So bro, I mean, I'm not saying that this, I'm not saying that this phone is a, is a weight, but it's pretty much all I do all day. No, that, you know what? And actually to, to put another point on that, Ron, in a way, the way you cognitively frame this is you are training for the COVID marathon. Like when, it, and this is the thing, bending the curve means eventually people may get infected. It just, it's just, giving you time. We bought you some time. Train for the damn COVID marathon. Get in shape. Lower your cytokine kindling. And in shape, you're going to talk more about that. And some of that you said is just spreading out exercise over the day, it's not being sedentary, sitting sitting all day is going to raise your cytokines. What, what, what else would you think about that? Okay. So there's three things I want you to think about. And this is really key because we have to do each of these. So I call this my ABCs. Okay. So the A is activity. So get regularly distributed activity like we talked about. The B part is breathing. And most of us are not good breathers. So while we're looking at media, while we're at work and stuff, even while you're sitting at rest, most of us breathe in our upper chest zone. We don't really send air to our diaphragm. And this is key because what people don't realize is our lungs are gigantic oxygen tanks that extend from our collarbones down to the top of our abdomen. But most of us are only using a very small part of that oxygen tank. And if you see this, you know, the, the reports of people and what they feel like when they get a severe COVID-19 infection, they feel like somebody put a bag over the head or they got dragged underwater or they got dropped at the top of Everest and were told to run a marathon. There is a significant air hunger that they can feel. There's others that don't feel that, but we know your ability to oxygen is compromised. So even while you're sitting and working and you're sedentary, you need to start engaging in diaphragmatic breathing practices. And this is something I really highlight in my recent post, because if we can engage that diaphragm, even at rest, you're going to get a lot more air into those lungs. So really key to make sure you do that. What a, what a great tip nobody talks about. Like, because, you know, we had Scott Weingart on the show talking about, he's an ER doc and talking about how his patients who are the happy hypoxemics, the ones who have very low blood oxygen levels, but they're actually comfortable, they're able to sustain a rapid respiratory rate so they can oxygenate without tiring. So their intercostal muscles, their diaphragm, all their sort of accessory muscles are kind of, kind of ripped. And so they're able to be like, <sighs> And, and just pant and do okay without needing a mechanical ventilator because they've tired out. So that's another aspect of training for that COVID marathon, it sounds like. Yeah, and I got to explain one thing to you. And, and I call this sort of hypoxia resilience. So a lot of us are able to tolerate short periods without air, and we do okay. Others have a very suffocating response to that. And just think about stress to our body. When we talk about our immune system responding, we can go, what, three weeks without food. Maybe we can go three to four days without water. We can't go more than three minutes without breathing. So the minute we feel air hunger, our immune system is on fire. And I gotta tell you, despite me doing a lot of exercise, I'm somebody who naturally didn't do a very good job of tolerating brief periods of air hunger. I'm not a good big fan of swimming. When they do that annoying N95 fitting, I hated that thing, right? They put that thing yeah. over you. But some of us intrinsically are not good at tolerating periods of air hunger. And you can actually train out of that. If you start using your diaphragm when you breathe in exercise, if you do some simple breathing techniques, 
you can actually remove that stress. And again, coming back to visceral fat, when we're in a hypoxic situation, the inflammation and cytokine storm comes from multiple directions, but studies have shown that one of the doors that gets unlocked under hypoxia is your visceral fat. Mm. So hypoxia can cause the visceral fat gates to open and flood open cytokines. So as we get more aerobically fit, Z, we're actually going to increase that threshold. So if you get barely out of breath going up a flight of stairs or walking around the block, we got to get that game better. We got to get you walking a little bit faster and improve endurance. Like you said, we got to train for this like a marathon. So we're not going to have that massive air hunger and cytokine release from this. And there's very simple ways that we can do that. I, I love it because it actually gives people something they can do instead of cowering in fear with cognitive distortions all day. You, you can actually go, oh, yeah, you know, here we go. And then you can journal about it, <laughs> how, how well it's going. You know, one, so I have a question for you. This is interesting, and I just it popped in my head. So you hear about this, there was an Ironman triathlete or something who got very sick with COVID, I think ended up on a ventilator. This is, maybe it's an apocryphal story, but I heard the story. Could it be that, because, and you've talked about this in your previous book, by the way, everyone should know, everybody should know that Ron has a website. What is it? South Asian Cultural Solutions? Yeah, it? yeah. Um, you could just, you can put in culturalhealthsolutions.com. I'll, I'll flash up the URL at the end, so no yeah, problem. Perfect. And we'll put it in the links to the description and everything. So so Ron has free resources, a free um, ebook and some other things that will give you some of this. So don't panic if you're trying to write down all the suggestions. He's got these online. Um, but the idea that, over-exercising, particularly aerobic exercise, can lead to a immune-deficient inflammatory state is something that we may want to just touch on real quick, yeah? I love it. Yeah, because I think, again, we have people in different ends of the spectrum. Some, we can't pull them out of the chair, so we got to get in, getting some movement. And then we've got type A's that are over-exercisers, and under more stress, they exercise even more. And there is an ideal dose to exercise, so if we're doing a lot of high intensity anaerobic where you're huffing and puffing through your mouth for extended periods of time, that could compromise and weaken the immune system. So typically for myself and other patients, I recommend if you wanna do more of an anaerobic type workout, if you're in shape for that, maybe do that not more than once a week. But really for baseline immune system function for longevity, you really wanna be in that aerobic zone. And a very simple rule of thumb I use to quantify this, if you do check heart rate, 180 minus your age is a great rule of thumb. There's a gentleman named Phil Mathetone. He trains elite athletes and uses 180 minus your age. So if you're 40 years old, your ceiling is going to be 140. You keep your heart rate about 120, 130, not above 140. It's an awesome kind of tool to sort of do. If you're not tracking heart rate, then go by nasal breathing. So how fast can I walk? And I'm breathing mostly through my nose. Or how fast can I walk where I can carry on a conversation with a little bit of effort, but I'm not really out of breath too much? Because that level of exercise you can do for 30, 40, 50 minutes. But if you're doing super high intensity, your time's kind of limited. You only do seven or 10 minutes, and then you're kind of pooped after that. You can't do much more than that, but that's sort of the sweet spot you want to hit for most of your physical activity. Got it. So, so walks are great. Walks are fantastic. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. It, uh, yeah. Of course, now they're making us wear uh, masks on our trails up here in Belmont. It's uh, yeah, it's really frustrating because it does discourage, I think, people from, from going out and enjoying the, the walk on the trail. But Z, I want to explain something to you. This is a very, this is an interesting hack. So one way that you can rapidly increase your oxygen tolerance. So, you know, what they found out with elite athletes decades ago is the one winning endurance gold medals were what? The ones that trained at high altitude, mm. above 7,000, basically. Mm. You can mimic some of that if you actually do a few things. Number one, when you exercise in your nasal breathing, you're kind of mimicking a low oxygen environment, and that causes your body to produce more red blood cells. You're kind of doping your blood in a natural way. And guess what? Even before this happened, I was training, because I told you I've had, a, a, I've had trouble before oxygen, I was using a high altitude mask. So this is my Kylo Ren brain mask. <laughs> so basically, I would put this on and get on my exercise bike. And I got to tell you, this has made a huge difference for me. And now in this environment, I can wear this out and I look like a superstar. People are like, wow, where the hell did you get that mask? That's like a superstar, you know? <laughs> but interestingly, I've had a couple of patients and they're exercising with their N95. In the beginning, they could not walk more than a block but now they can walk very comfortably with a little bit of oxygen restriction from their mask. And that is actually a sign that their VO2 max or oxygenation is actually improving. So that's one hack you can actually use to assess that. My, you know, it's rare that you see me on the show suddenly change my mind about something. So I've been railing and ranting about having to wear a mask on my own trail and what a violation of my personal liberty this is. And now I'm like, well, actually it may be better. <laughs> 
<laughs> it might be a training tool. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, when I lived in Las Vegas, we were at altitude of about 2,500 feet, not that high, but I had a swimming pool. So what I would do is I, it was just long enough that I enjoyed doing laps without ever taking a breath. So I would go, you know, back and forth without taking a breath. And I got really good at that. I actually checked my my uh, hematocrit uh, as part of a normal lab run, and I was like 50. Like I actually had some polycythemia, but I my exercise tolerance was amazing. So it is you're kind of putting some stress and training at altitude, but do, having to suck air through an N95 might be a nice uh, <laughs> right, a nice right. way to get those. And impossible. obviously, some disclaimers for asthmatics and COPD yes, yes, patients. Yes, yes, for some people. Honestly, if, if even if you're breath holding in a limited way, if you, I have some patients that cannot hold their breath more than 15 seconds without getting into hyperventilation, right? It's such a suffix. So I tell them, listen, work on the diaphragmatic breathing first in a very calm, relaxed way, and then maybe just do nasal breathing while you walk and gradually kind of take the slope up gently. And it's incredible what a difference. And putting COVID-19 aside, your energy focus, everything gets so much better just by doing that. In that ebook, I put a list of all my favorite exercises to do, so I'll share that with you at the end. That's great. And to get the ebook, do people have to just give their email or something? Or That's all they got to do. Perfect. Yeah, okay. it's free, and what's, it's what I'm using with all my Silicon Valley companies. So, I love yeah. it. And one, one disclaimer I want to make, and Ron is a friend of mine, and he's been on the show several times. Sometimes when we talk about this stuff, we get into that, like, it, it, it nervously close to the Dr. Oz style of talking where it's like, you know what I mean? Where both of us, where we're like, okay, so the thing is, if you want to improve your, so just so you know, we're both legit doctors and we're not, try, we're not trying to sell you anything. All right. Yeah, I, I guess that was until I put my mask on, right? I'm at a, I might have lost some credentials right there. You're going to sell that Kylo Ren action, you know, well, what's the deal here? Uh, so, so keep, keep going, Ron, educate me. So in a quick question, a quick side question here, because we know that diabetes is a risk factor for doing poorly on COVID. Is that for all the reasons you're saying uh, that it's an, a pro-inflammatory state, or do we not just know yet? We don't know yet, but they're, they're, you're right. It's a pro-inflammatory state for sure. And also we know with insulin resistance, coming back to breathing and respiration, insulin resistance is intimately tied to defects in mitochondrial function and aerobic respiration. So one of the early signs of insulin resistance is actually a depressed or diminished VO2 max. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because when we're insulin resistant, we tend to have our fat in more of a stored state. So we're not able to adequately liberate fatty acids to fuel our mitochondria. So one interesting thing I wanna bring up is they actually did a study on breath holding times and they took people with a very elevated body weight, body mass index, and elevated waist to hips um, ratio, which is a sign of visceral fat. And you would think that anybody with an elevated body weight would have trouble holding their breath. But interestingly, they found, Z, that the people with high BMIs and total weight, they weren't that different than the control group. But it was the ones with increased visceral fat that actually struggled, struggled more with, um, with breath holding times. So that tells us it's not just mechanical compression, although that can play a role, but there is something metabolic happening. And I really think it is the impairment in mitochondrial function and aerobic respiration that's making insulin resistant people more breathless. So there is some physical component, but I think the metabolic inflammatory component is a real key part of this. Interesting. And folks like Jason Fung have talked a little bit about this as well, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, other physicians. So th this is interesting because in China, you don't have a lot of, say, you know, morbid obesity like we have here or even a lot of obesity, but you have that sort of skinny fat phenotype, right? Where they have visceral fat, their diet is changing. And there was quite a bit of uh, original mortality around COVID-19. Have you uh, made any correlations here with our Asian population? Yeah, you're right. So I think that's why in Asian populations, it just does take a few extra inches around the stomach. And we can see that elevation, which is why I'm intensifying the education of that community. But you know, one of the things is when we talk about this topic, I've had people flood me with emails saying, do I need to get a six pack now, right? Do I need to get rid of all my fat? I've got a lot of women saying that, listen, I feel like I'm gonna die because of all this belly fat. But in a lot of women in other cultures, that extra body fat is subcutaneous. It's not that deep store of fat. Mm. So there's not a simple way to measure that. But what I would tell you is there are some blood markers that can tell you whether your fat's probably more inflammatory. And some of those blood markers are number one, if you've got an elevated triglyceride, or low HDL, those are types of cholesterol markers. If your glucose is abnormal and you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, if you've got fatty liver, which we've talked about before, that's a sign probably you got more inflammatory fat. 
Or I don't recommend everyone check this, but in select people, I do check a C-reactive protein, a highly sensitive C-reactive protein. That's an inflammatory marker. And interestingly, there are studies that show, I know I keep using the same term NLRP3. Actually, the way to think about NLR3P is naughty by nature song. It's NLRP3. You know me, right? So just think of that. We'll never forget it. But NLRP3 does actually elevate C-reactive protein. So a lot of my patients with elevated CRP levels, that's also a sign they probably got more of that inflammatory fat. And when they make the lifestyle and dietary changes, that goes down along with the body fat as well, too. Very important because it's modifiable. Because you down with NLRP3? Oh, yeah, you know me. Dude, I told you that like one of my pet peeves is every single person on the planet sends me at some point in their lifespan their idea for a Naughty by Nature uh, OPP parody. And, it, and, and I can't tell you I've gotten a thousand ones saying, can you do, 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 you know, I'm down with PPE. I'm like, no, I can't. You know, now I know how Weird Al feels when everyone asked him to do my Corona. You can add me to the list. Sorry, man. I lost some credibility there. <laughs> hey, at least, you, at least you used a molecule that's kind of obscure. Everyone else is like, you're down with EKG? Oh, yeah. You, I'm like, no, I'm not down with EKG. So, so, so uh, um, b back to this piece. Now, um, we were talking, about again, about inflammatory cascade. Now, I think it's real interesting that you make the distinction between subcutaneous and visceral fat because it's true. And, 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 and it is hard to kind of measure, but what can we do then if you're thinking about actions to reduce visceral fat? Is it diet? Is it exercise? Is it both? Like what, how, how can a lay person think yeah. about this? Yeah, you know, so you're right. The exercise stuff we talked about, I think is universal, uh, you know, regardless of body type. But if you've got more of the visceral fat, which is more probably connected to insulin, then you do want to be conscious about the excessive carbohydrate consumption, which is getting worse now because so many of us are cooking all types of treats and doing a lot of baking. So we got to really be careful with that carbohydrate intake. So I'd be focused on that. I think, you know, intermittent fasting, I know is a popular health trend. I think this is a great time to think about intermittent fasting. If you cannot control your caloric intake, can we compress it into a tighter window and avoid eating beyond 7, 7.30 p.m.? A lot of people are doing a lot of late night stress eating. And I tell them, listen, if you can't control the desserts and the baked goods and the extra carbs, at least try to finish them by 6.30 or 7 p.m. and then have that dessert with your dinner and then just close your mouth after that. That way your brain's at least satisfied from the brownie or the piece of pie, but now you're giving your liver and your body a good 12, 14, maybe 16 hours to process that and get rid of it so your inflammation markers are not as high. But don't stretch the eating into late night. So I think those simple tactics can really help you. And the morning, when you do that physical activity, can you do some of it in a fasted state? That can really help lower inflammation and visceral fat too. So I think adjusting your timing can help you get through this pretty well too. Absolutely. And our mutual friend, uh, Peter Atia has a great framework for thinking about that, right? He says, you have these three levers you can pull when it comes to diet. And here we are in the pandemic and the lever of when to eat, the time window is one lever you can pull. So say you still want to have that, you know, Lunardi's ice cream treat, but you eat it, like you said, in a narrow window with your dinner, and then you have a period where your body is able to, you burn that off, and then maybe you even switch to a little bit of fat burning or ketones if, if the fast is long enough. Maybe you don't, but at least it's time to, to clear that out. So that one lever, the other level is lever is what you eat, so what kind of macronutrients, and you mentioned carbohydrates as something that if you do have a lot of visceral fat, trying to cut some of that out might help, especially the refined carbohydrates that tend to promote that inflammatory, insulin-resistant uh, type of phenotype and then the third one is how much you eat right which that one i cannot control i just eat too much <laughs> did i miss anything there or any other thoughts on that did i miss anything that i that you think people should i think know? those are the big ones and the last thing i'd say about exercise because this is a challenge i'm seeing in a lot of my patients that are gym rats because they used to do all their lifting and everything in a gym and now maybe they're in a small studio apartment they don't have access to the equipment so one personal change i've made is i'm doing a lot of good old-fashioned PE exercises. I'm back to doing push-ups and burpees and pull-ups. And I got to say that I do feel like I've lost more weight and I've got better energy from doing that. And, you know, a lot of times we think because of muscle mass that the more muscle mass we add on, the longer we're going to live. 
But actually, if you take a deeper look at these studies, it's not just about strength, it's about power. It's how fast can you move a given amount of mass, which is your body. So doing springy type things, doing a little bit of plyometrics, me going outside with the boys and shooting baskets, you know, doing a lot of those kind of springy type activities is really good rather than, gosh, I can't deadlift as much as I can because I can't get into a gym right now. So I would diversify. I think the main goal of this whole process is we're going to be back in our gyms and, you know, eventually in some time. But how do we create these independent tools that when I'm on a business trip, when I'm on vacation, when I'm stuck in this area, now I can tap into my own body as a gym. I can manipulate my eating timing. This is a great time to learn some lessons because we're in a controlled environment. My patients now, I don't have to worry about, oh, God, where are you going on vacation this summer? How many times are you socializing on the weekends? You can make incredible changes now over the next several months because you're in a fairly confined situation where you can make these changes. And once you see the results of those changes, it's going to be sustainable once we're released back into the wild again, right? <laughs> I like that term, released into the wild. You know, it, it's a crazy time, man. I, it's, it really is. Now, here's a question that relates to that. So a lot of people now are finding that there's a new stress introduced in this, which is you're working from home. So there's a, a few different interesting and unique stresses. One is that there's no work day anymore. It's just work. So the work-life separation is now just work life integration and it may be not a good way. So you don't control your hours as much. You don't control your weekends as much because everyone just assumes you're working all the time. And the second thing is something that I've done a show about, which is I called or was called zoom fatigue, where there's a certain level of stress having these interactions via tele when we're unable to pick up cues properly. We have so much attention that we have to focus. Like if you and I, Ron, were sitting in a room together, we have enough bandwidth that we can read each other's subtle cues. We can tune out a little bit, get peripheral vision, have shoot the, shoot the breeze. Whereas now it's like you and I have to pay attention the entire time. So any thoughts on that stuff? Yeah, no, I, I, to, I think you, you've nailed it. I mean, I've actually experienced a Zoom fatigue as well, too. But, you know, that schedule disruption you talked about, I went through it, too. I mean, it was incredible how I just forget to eat or I was working at different times. And this is a big problem because it disrupts our circadian rhythm. And, and the issue with that is if we're eating at different times every day, we're going to bed at different times, our melatonin production is going to be off. And melatonin is, is really what helps us sleep at night. It helps us fall asleep, and it keeps our schedule in rhythm. So try to make some sort of makeshift schedule. And by the way, I want to throw out the melatonin actually, when it's depressed, melatonin is one of the key hormones that tames that NLRP3 inflammation. So when we're looking at blue screens late into the night and stuff, we can really have an impact on the cytokines in an adverse way. But really try to set that schedule up whenever you can, because that'll help you quite a bit. We have to do this with the kids too, because even their schedules, if you've got teens in the house, right, they're staying up all hours, I think they're on their laptop doing their work or are they doing something else? God only knows. So yeah. we got really to set some guardrails around our schedule. You know, it's interesting. Is that brought, brings me back to that slide you showed with the two columns. Can you pull that up again? Because I just want to point a couple things out. Um, so and I'll, I'll talk it through for people who are on the podcast version. Um, the the interesting thing that Ron just said about sleep and melatonin and inflammation is super important. And Peter Atia and others have talked about how crucial uh, sleep is in terms of um, our overall health. We underestimate how important this is. And if it's leading to higher levels of inflammation, then we're at more risk, heaven forbid, if, if, if the COVID infects us. Do you, do you have that slide? I see this is the cognitive reappraisal slide. Do we have that? Yeah, sorry. Perfect. Okay. So good. So we got stress mental health, which we talked about. Tell me about meditation a little. What are you doing on the meditation side? I am actually meditating more than I ever had. And one of the things, so I'll tell you one part of my health that's been affected is the sleep part. As much as I try to be regimented about these things, Z, I found myself sometimes getting up at 3, 3 or 3 30 in the me morning. Too. Me too. But rather than, you too? Yeah. yeah. But rather than stay in bed and ruminate, I actually go into my closet. I've got a little corner set up. And I do some breathing and I do some meditation during that time. And I got to say, it's been a game changer because at the end of that, I sometimes get tired enough where I'm back in bed at 4.30, then I sleep for an hour and a half. And also, even if I don't get to sleep, at least I got some mental rest and I did something good for my body rather than lay in bed thinking about, am I going to die tomorrow, right? So, wow. so that's been What a great idea. Okay, let, that's brilliant. Let me go back to... Uh to your slide here. So we've got sleep, which we talked about. 
Um, and we, we did the, on our other show, I think we talked a little bit about sleep, particularly around kids and teenagers and how you reframe. That's all definitely linked to that piece. Nu- nutrition we talked about, activity we talked about. Um, now, conditions and visceral fat we did talk about. Anything on the immune side that you want to talk about in terms of promoting better, healthier immune system? Yeah, I mean, I think everything we talked about has a direct impact on it. But with the nutrition part, there are definitely specific foods that are more tailored for that specific inflammatory pathway. Obviously, we know we got to eat more plants and greens and diverse vegetables. But it's interesting how certain foods, like, for example, specific spices, turmeric seems like it's good for everything, but turmeric is really powerful at taming that NLRP3 um, inflammatory pathway. If you guys are caffeine drinkers, green tea with EGCG, green tea actually has a chemical catechins, which are excellent for taming down NLP, uh, NLRP3 inflammation. So there are specific foods that are really good for anti-inflammatory effects. So I'd sort of say that, yeah, with diet, be healthier. But some of my patients that do a lot of fasting, when they're actually eating, they're not eating very nutrient-dense foods. So within that eating window, make sure you're prioritizing foods that really have impact on immunity specifically. It's kind of interesting because we have a nationwide, worldwide shortage of yeast because people are doing home baking. And it, it's real It's real because I think we tried to find some. And it's interesting because people don't normally bake bread at home, per se, unless you do that. Now, and so it does make you think we're shifting to a more comfort menu with DoorDash delivery and Grubhub and these kind of sort of eating out, bringing it home, sitting around in your underwear and eating high carbohydrate, refined carbohydrate foods. And I don't think that's going to bode well when you look at, you know, when you look at where this thing is hitting people hard, whether it's, you know, uh, Louisiana, where there's a high prevalence of diabetes um, and those sort of things, you know, we, I, again, it gives us some control to say, now we're training for this thing so we can make changes that might actually stick. Yeah. I mean, the other key point you, you sort of brought up indirectly is also where these patients are disconnected from the healthcare system. Mm. They're not getting labs checked as often, you know, even the process of not going to work when was the last time i put on a pair of jeans we're living in stretchy pants all day and a lot of us don't know that we've gained two or three inches right so so one of the things i'm doing personally is i don't want to be obsessive but i do check my weight twice a day because i know the minute i start going up this threshold i got to tailor things back so i would say do the quantify yourself thing if you're measuring blood sugars your waistline your weight your blood pressures keep track of that and then use telemedicine because i know our medical group is totally open wide with telemedicine visits engage with your doctor. Don't wait for four to five months to find out that, oh my God, my blood pressure is out of control. My sugar is out of control. Because like we said at the beginning, this is no longer by 10 year risk. This might be 10 day risk. So we got to make sure we're on top of that right away. That's a great way to phrase it. It's not a 10 year risk anymore. It's a 10 day risk. You know, it's weird, Ron. Like, so part of the reason, you know, we were both talking about waking up in the middle of the night and having some degree of stress and that sort of thing. And I love the idea that you, that you have a meditation egg that like doc, like Darth Vader that you go to when, you know, shit hits the fan and you're like, okay, I'm here now. I'm going to do my breathing. And that's great. I think that's a great piece of advice. I do my, I try to do my meditation in, in, um, the morning, but sometimes the reason I wake up in the middle of the night is I'll have like a mini panic attack of, oh my gosh, you know, I am eating worse and I am at risk because I'm in my, you know, later forties now. And I have factor five Leiden and prothrombin 2021A heterozygous mutation. So I'm at high risk of blood clotting. And so if I get COVID, I might have some of these blood and then you start ruminating on it and you go, man, I've been, I've been, my visceral fat's getting a little worse. And that, that can lead to a sort of a, a mini sort of panic. If you realize that those things can have adverse consequences or you can go, okay, so yeah, that, that the, it's distorted thinking to catastrophize about that, but it's not distorted thinking to go, oh, okay, then I'll just make a mental note in the morning. I'm going to make sure to try to that day to eat in a narrower window and maybe, you know, one less sli- you know, scoop of that ice cream, whatever it is. And right, so- right. And you remember in past talks, we talked about, okay, so I overfilled my muscle parking lot, right? So if I overfilled that lot, tomorrow, I don't need to eat breakfast. So I'll go for a nice 30, 40 minute hike because guess what? I don't have to drive to work anymore. I've got time on my schedule. I'm going to do that first, clear out some space and then come back in. So you did a beautiful example of cognitive reframing right there. Instead of, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to take control and do something corrective 
and then sort of move on. That's really a critical shift in thinking. Yeah. You know, what's interesting too, Ron, is that in the old days, and again, if you have a, a disordered eating pattern or you have some other issues, intermittent fasting and the time window stuff can be very tricky. And we don't, you know, again, you have to talk to a doctor, but for me, having that toolkit of saying, you know what, I am not going to eat breakfast or lunch today. I'm only going to eat dinner because I really fell off the wagon a little bit today. And I feel like every, yeah, every muscle is full of glucose. My liver is full of glucose and I'm overflowing into fat. Well, okay. At least I can feel better the next day by allowing that to then empty out a bit and then eating a sensible dinner in, in, in the evening. So exactly. you have that control. Hey. Yep, absolutely. I think you have that control. The other trick I want to teach you, again, despite me doing all this, I also, I grew up on a lot of carbs and sugar. So one of the things is knowing that meal combinations can mitigate some of the damage. So if I'm feeling like having that Lenardi's ice cream, if I actually put some berries or had some berries on the side, if I had some other healthy foods around that, it's going to limit the glycemic spike. So when I get a chocolate craving, I've got these 70% dark chocolate chips. I put it on Greek yogurt, and then I'll get my chocolate fix while I'm having that with Greek yogurt and some berries. So meal combinations can mitigate some of the effects of just having a pure junk food itself. If it's a little bit of chips, but on the side you've got some salad or something, just think about creative ways that you can mix the right foods around the wrong foods to limit some of that inflammation. You know, there was one study that actually showed with inflammation, if you had a big mass burger, basically, versus having the burger with avocado on top of that, the avocado actually limits vasoconstriction and inflammation. So that's the way you sort of think about it. if you're grilling a lot of meats, how do I add veggies around that to sort of mitigate those impacts? You know, it's funny, I, I, I've instinctively done that and then I always question that, am I just adding calories to calories? Because you, you, know, you put a slice of avocado and now I'm just adding more fat and calories, but it's different. It's good fat. It's also like anti-inflammatory for the reasons that you talk about and it slows overall glycemic index by changing the absorption pattern of the food. And when you mention berries, I want to really put a point on that one because I personally have found that, and the problem with berries is again, it, they can be expensive, especially if it's not in season. So you do, it's a little bit of a elite position to tell people to eat a lot of berries, but if you can get them and, and they're good, they really do. First of all, they can satisfy a bit of a sweet tooth without a high glycemic index. They have a lot of fiber and they do seem to change the pattern of absorption of, of stuff that you eat with them. So they're, and they've got antioxidants and all the other jazz. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and a quick hack for that too. And I agree with what you said about the economics of berries, but at Costco, we sometimes get the big bag of frozen organic berries. Oh. And my real quick breakfast is sometimes I'll get Greek yogurt and I'll put the frozen berries on my Greek yogurt. It almost feels like you're having ice cream because it's cold already. But even in the frozen state, you're getting a lot of locked in nutrients. So I know a lot of us don't want to be going to the grocery store very often and berries can go bad quickly, but you know, frozen options are okay for fruits and produce. You still are going to get some nutrients from them. That's great. That's great. So any other things you want to make sure that this audience oh, knows? Yeah. yeah. I got one last thing. I'm, and this is a little bit of a tribute to you as well. Too. Oh, so, good Lord. Okay. <laughs> 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 right. So, so this, I call you ZDAG, I call you the triple threat or the triple therapy for COVID-19. <laughs> Honestly, because number one, you are always providing knowledge. So you're helping us activate the prefrontal cortex. Number two, you're providing laughter, which you're doing right now. So that's <laughs> diaphragmatic engagement. And we know laughter activates the parasympathetic system. And the third is music. I didn't pull up the study, but there's a couple of studies that show that the more we listen to music, it can actually suppress cytokines, including interleukin eight and six. So you're providing triple therapy. I mean, a, a lot of times I tell people, if you're looking at stressful news, make the environment better, play your favorite songs in the back and just try to take the edge off the stress. Don't be in a room, in a dark room under your covers, looking at all this stuff. We can change those cues. But, but I want to personally thank you on behalf of my patients, people that I send to you. You put a lot of work and energy into your work and it's helping heal a lot of us in this tremendous environment. So just a personal thanks to you for that. I'm rarely speechless, Ron, but you took <laughs> I know. I don't think I've ever seen that before. <laughs> you, you took me by surprise with that one. I'm really honored and touched, and it makes me feel like I should be billing an ICD or CPT code for my services. <laughs> They're going to they forget about selling out to big pharma. You're selling out to big Z dog. Uh, you know what I mean? But it all, all joking aside, like what you do. And when I read your book 
and looked at your website and we first met really and engaged on this stuff, I was just blown away by how much you are really helping people in a way that a lot of doctors haven't been trained to do. And you had to, you had to up, up speed yourself on this stuff and you do it in a way that is never, you're never selling anything. You're never dogmatic and you always are humble in the face of what we don't know. And I think that's what really uh, 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 gets me excited about getting you on the show. And I'd love to have you back, assuming that you're in good shape to survive COVID because I hope so. <laughs> you and me are having a COVID party so we can get immune, right? Right, bro? <laughs> exactly right. We got to do that. <laughs> we're, there's going to be a front front page news of like, you know, Fierce Healthcare or one of these like healthcare journals, like two- Masks only, man. You got to show up with this. This ma- is your cover charge. Mass out, mass out. That's right. <laughs> That's right. They're going to be like two top, you know, internet doctors dead <laughs> of hubris for, for self-infecting with COVID. <laughs> oh, my God. And, right. you know, I'm, I did most of my growing up in Bakersfield. My mom's there. So that, that, was a, that, was, that was a rough news clip when that came out. Dude, so, and, yeah. you know, I grew up in Clovis, which is down the road, right? So we were, yeah, we were Central Valley neighbors. And, dude, I mean, yeah, when I saw that, the thing is, you know, and the thing is, I, I really wanted to uh, believe them. And then yeah. just all oh, the science, man, that's the problem. You really can't speak with that level of certainty without really having your data right. <laughs> you got it. Hey, yeah. That's why we need people like you doing the work you're doing. Thanks for that. No, dude, likewise, likewise. Brother, so, okay, so what's your website? Spell it out for us. Yeah, so it's culturalhealthsolutions.com. It's a mouthful. Um, but, you know, I put up just as an FYI, um, let me just get this right here. Perfect. Um, I put up my resources here. You know, oh, Z, great. because I like teaching people with videos so much, I'm actually launching a co-video series where I'm actually putting short three to four minute instructional videos that teach people these concepts. I call it Sinha Co-Videos. So, and the ebook, like I said, is just, it's a free resource for the community and for corporations. So I'm updating that with new breathing practices, my exercise arsenal, all these things. So hopefully these can be resources that'll benefit you. I'm not selling snake oil on these. This is purely to educate people around the world. So hopefully that'll be a helpful resource. I love it, dude. That is fantastic. And I will send everybody to your resources because they are legit, too legit, too legit. (laughs) to quit. Uh, on that note, yeah. on that note uh, I think we did a thing here. Uh, this was so much fun, Ron. Thank you. Um, ZPAC, listen, go to the website. I'll put the links in here. This is an actual call to action that you're training for this thing. You have a horizon. Let's say it's a couple weeks where you're going to get in shape. You know, we feel so powerless, right? That we're not, we don't have enough PPE that we're going to work, putting ourselves at risk. But here's the thing. There are things you can do to keep yourself and your family safe. And it's stress reduction, sleep, diet, exercise. These kind of things that we're talking about will put you at, in the best position if heaven forbid you actually get infected and not only that but it's going to put you in the best position for life after covid which believe it or not despite all the catastrophizing ron (laughs) there is going to be life after covid right Agreed. agreed and on that note i would love to ask you guys to share this video with anyone you care about please 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 leave a comment um have your voice heard subscribe to the show all that other stuff I love you guys. Stay safe and we out. Thanks, Ron, again. See you next time. Stay safe, brother. Peace.